Father, we just thank you for this evening and, Lord, for this time to gather with you and with one another to worship your name, Lord, now, and to turn our attention to your word. Just ask, Lord, as we step through it, you give us guidance, help us to find application, Lord, and to just hear your voice. And as we just sang, Lord, to just enjoy this time in your presence, in your word, with you, you with us, Lord. So we just thank you in advance, and we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just as a reminder, we had last week off, and that's just enough time to forget everything. Um, we're at that part of the beginning of Book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, going through the seven churches that Jesus asked John to write these letters to. And we've covered the first two. We looked at Ephesus the first time, and then we looked at Smyrna this last time, and then tonight we'll move to the third. And again, just to remind us, there's a lot of different ways that these seven churches are thought of. Um, some people like to take the seven churches and make a history of the church out of those seven churches, show some sort of history stepping through the condition of the church over time. Personally, and you don't have to agree with me, I do not see, I do not see support for that. I, I mean, you could probably make the argument, but I think you'd have to make the argument. But if, if you can find that and you're comfortable with that, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, what I definitely do, do believe is that it spoke specifically to seven specific churches about the conditions of their church body and the things that they were facing in line with the cultures in which they lived and the influences that were against their people just being citizens of those places. And another thing I believe strongly that it does is it gives us as a church in these days the ability to give ourselves a litmus test, see how we're doing. Do we have any of these things going on in our church today that they were wrestling with that we need to heed the same instruction they had from Jesus himself on how to correct those things or to look and to see we're doing things well in certain areas and thank the Lord for that and continue doing well in those areas. <clears throat> and then from that, I think because we are the church, not the building, and, we, and it's made up, the church is made up by individual believers so I would say then we could use this also as a litmus test for our own lives, personally, how we live with Christ within us in our day-to-day -day lives. So with that as a refresher, we come to verse 12 of chapter 2. And I don't have a slide show, but I have some slides to show along the way um, just to kind of enhance this. And we come to this third church, which is Pergamos. And it's also called Pergamon in some places or Pergamum. In other places, um, I actually had to go through my notes and see which ones I used as I studied. I think I got them all as Pergamos, but maybe not. Um, but this particular church was situated about 37 miles beyond to the north of Smyrna, which was the last, which was the last um, church that we studied. And the way that you would get from that last church, Smyrna, to this church is long, along an old Roman um, postal road. They were connected by that. <clears throat> so some of the slides I want to show you and some of the things we're going to talk about with this church, um, some of them, somebody, somebody could probably say some of these things are just trivia, um, but I don't think any of the things I'm going to bring up tonight are trivial. Um, but I love this church because it lends to a couple interesting things that I just kind of think is interesting to throw out there and for us to chew on. But um, drop these lights. I don't know what that's going to do to the video. But uh, actually, let's just leave this stage light off and probably put the other two one, no, that one off, those on. Yeah, because I don't think the video will take it otherwise. So just to get a kind of an idea of the area that these churches are in, in case you can't picture it as far as geography goes. I mean, you got the majority of Europe up here to the north. There's the lower boot of Italy. Greece and the Greek islands, and then, you know, Crete out here. You come over here, there's Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Cy Cyprus. And here in the big country of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, are all these churches that were planted. And so we've been through Ephesus, we went through Smyrna, and now we're going all the way up here to Pergamum. And then just kind of a close-up of those churches in that geographic area just to kind of give you an idea. So when we come to these, you kind of have a, a bit of a picture in your mind. 
Now, Pergamos, the word means elevation. It also means exalted or high tower. And that really speaks to just the, the geographic location. Some of these slides are kind of dark, but they sat you know, on a massive hill, and uh, that's not all of Pergamos. There was a lot more going on there, but that's just part of the ruins of the main part that was left. There was really a lot there at one time, about 200,000 people. Um, but it was a major political center. And matter of fact, Pergamos was the most influential city in the Roman Empire at one time. And it was located there. Well, some of the things that were located there was like huge amount of temples. And there were temples to the Greek and Roman gods, in particular Dionysus, Athena, Demeter, and Zeus. Zeus being really the champion of, the, of their um, pantheon of gods. And it was also the center of ancient sun worship. And the place where a famous altar of Zeus stood on a terrace of slopes that was on the mountain. Pergamus also had three temples dedicated to the worship of the emperor, the Roman emperor. We saw that with Smyrna as well, that they were involved eventually in emperor worship. Now, the city was especially known as a center dedicated to wisdom um, and to healing, and that was dedicated to that because of a particular god that they worshipped. And the god's name was Asclepius. And if you want to do an interesting study in Roman gods, this was an interesting one, Asclepius. He was represented by a serpent, and Asclepius was the god, as I said, of healing and knowledge. And his symbol was a serpent that should ring a bell with you, a serpent that was wrapped around a pole. So the very familiar symbol that medical has today of the caduceus is basically began with the symbol for this god. <clears throat> and the sick and diseased people from all over Rome, all over the Roman Empire, flocked to Pergamus for relief. And it was set up sort of like a hospital and also a spa. Um, for, for both, and it was interesting, but it, it was for both psychological and physical healing. As the best can be told, this was like the, the birth of psychology and what they did. But I'm going to tell you in a moment how they did that. And, uh, well, some of it could be just as strange as psychology today, I guess, but not completely. There was even a medical school located there. <clears throat> but what they would do as far as helping people psychologically is that they would march them up to the temple. And inside the temple, there was an area where it was circular in nature, which would kind of have the crowd, whoever many were there, they kind of march around in a circle until they were ushered into and then under or into tunnels and then underneath the temple. And then when they would lead them down there, there were cooby holes, if you will, in the walls along the way. And they would put people in those individually and they would spend the night there and they would sleep there. And then when they would rise in the morning, they'd be taken back down to the physician's and they would then tell their dreams. And it was from their dreams that the doctors would determine what was wrong with them and then prescribe who knows what. Um, but, you know. And, uh, you know, not so different from medicine today. You know, probably sent them right to the pharmacy with a script. Now, near the medical center stood the world's second largest library. It's so only second after the Alexandrian Library. And it's told that there was a collection of some 200,000 um, volumes in there. Every time I read about ancient libraries, I'm just incensed that they're gone. I mean, you think about the, you know, that was second. I mean, you think about how vast Alexandrian Library was. Um, and I mean, I mean th at that time, I mean, how far back and allegedly only so many years prior to that, and yet they had that much to say. I mean, we've lost so much. And, you know, there's, there's still a lot left, and even a great deal, I'm just sharing this in case you don't know, a great deal of what still remains a knowledge, one of the most vast libraries on earth no one has access to without special permission, and it's in the basement of the Vatican. The Vatican Library is protected by their own troops. And, you can, and it can only be in there by invite, and they probably won't let you touch very much. Um, gosh, can you imagine what's in there? It drives me nuts. 
And then there another feature of the city was an amphitheater. We said that same thing with Ephesus. The amphitheaters in those days was built just incredibly um, well. And here again, the acoustics were so good that a whisper on stage could be heard all the way in the very top row of that, which makes me laugh when we have problems with our sound system every week in a room this big. That's a picture of it. Seats a lot of people. The seats don't look very comfortable. I was going to get a close-up of a seat. It definitely doesn't look comfortable. <clears throat> so verse 12, let's take a look. It says, and to the angel of Pergamos write, and remember, this is Jesus speaking to John, and there you see this angel of, and we talked about that a couple times now, and we're shown that picture in the beginning of the lamp stands within, you know, representing the churches, and then an angel for each church. And the question becomes, is it an actual angel over each church, or was that word just being used as it plainly means messenger and possibly the leader of each of those churches? We don't know for sure. Um, but to the angel of the church of Pergamos, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, if you remember, John observed this about Jesus. He said, out of his mouth, out of Jesus' mouth, went a sharp two-edged sword. So Jesus confronts this church in Pergamos with his word. The word of God is marked by sharp edges when you really think about it. a matter of fact, as, as the writer of Hebrews put it, it's a description of the word of God itself. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when God's word goes out, it does a lot. It should change us because it literally penetrates us both flesh and soul. And so he's using the strength of that to talk to this church, to talk to us as a church. And now as we move forward, Jesus addresses the things that he was observing in this church at Pergamos. Look at verse 13. He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, was where Satan dwells. So Pergamos was headquarters for the cult of emperor worship in all of Asia. And that's one reason it's called the place of Satan's throne. And despite being surrounded by paganism, this church remained loyal to Jesus. They remained loyal even though one of its members, Antipas, and we'll talk more about him here in a bit, he was martyred for his confession of faith. And he was the first known believer in Asia to die for refusing to worship the emperor. Another reason Pergamos was called the place of Satan's throne and a place where Satan dwells was the presence of a huge throne-like altar dedicated to the Roman god Zeus. Now Zeus in the Greek pantheon of gods is equivalent to the Hebrew god, small g, of Baal that we read about in the Old Testament. So keep that in mind. Now this altar that I'm speaking of, it was erected by the Greek king, a Greek king called Eumenes. He was Eumenes II. And he ruled around 197 to 159 BC. And he, and he erected this altar as a memorial to his father, who was Attalos I. And the immense building was not only dedicated to Zeus, but also to Athena, the goddess of victory, who became the patroness and protector of Pergamos. The ruins of that altar were discovered by a German engineer named Carl Wilhelm Hummann in 1878. And following its discovery, a museum was constructed in Berlin, Germany, to house the altar, which was transported from the site in Turkey to that location. And then that museum was opened in 1930. Now, eventually, the altar caught the eye of a young man named Albert Speer. 
And he was the new chief architect of the Nazi party. And Germany's new chancellor, a man you know his name, Adolf Hitler, had commissioned Speer to design the parade grounds for the party rallies at Nuremberg. Well, for inspiration, Speer turned to the Pergamus altar, this throne of Satan. This is what it looks like sitting in the museum. Another picture from the front. And just to give you some scale, they moved that from Turkey to Berlin, Germany, which I find amazing just on its own. Now, let's back up. Just kind of get the picture of that in your mind. And then you come to what Mr. Speer brought about from Mr. Hitler. And that's the place where you see those giant crowds with Hitler in the front, manically speaking to everybody. And you can see the design where he took it from that throne. Another look just kind of from the edge and the massive crowds there. And then from a distance. We'll keep that in mind. It'll on the sides of the altar, you may have noticed there was pretty detailed carvings, and they're pretty well preserved. And those carvings that you see on the side there are a depiction of a great battle. And it was a titanic battle between giants. And it was a battle between the Olympian Zeus and the nether forces of Chaos, led by a giant named Alcyoneus. Now, I find this interesting when we consider this odd connection between Pergamus' seat of Satan and Hitler's stage at Nuremberg. Now, if you know your history, you know that the Prussian Empire was, a, was entangled in affairs that eventually led to the country, country of Germany being established. Well, interestingly, the Prussian monarchy was found by, listen, the militia of Zeus in 1701 eventually establishing its capital in Berlin. Now, King Frederick I was its first king. And his father, I mean, he was the father of King Frederick II, who was known as Frederick the Great. And Frederick the Great, you've got to kind of add everything up I'm talking about here. Frederick the Great created a huge standing army and a regiment. Now, listen of giants for his small kingdom. And the regiment of giant soldiers were called the Postdam Grenadiers. Now, I can't swear to the accuracy of the pictures, but they were, they were made back in those days of the time I'm talking about. I find that top one very interesting. You've got three different sizes of humans. And then this one, they don't, you don't have those smaller ones, but you have the troops, which are giant. There's a picture of how they would dress. Allegedly, they were all well up into the high six foot or beyond measure. How he gathered all of these, and I'm not trying to compare them to the giants of the Old Testament, but it's just interesting how all these things tie together with Berlin and Germany and Hitler. And then the, the whole thing about the giants on the side and then the giants in this thing and that they were commissioned under the name of Zeus. So, not trying to make too much of it, but it seems that Frederick the Great was 200 years ahead of Adolf Hitler in trying to create a super race. Now, how did he... Because it says literally in the literature that he created this army of giants. I don't know how that would happen. I would imagine more that he would went and collected very, very big people. But anyway, I just find it really interesting how that all seems to tie again. But... Here's one more interesting connection, and it doesn't have to do with giants, but it does have to do with one man named Barack Obama. Now, on July 24th, 2008, during his presidential campaign, and again on June 19th, 2013, during his presidency, Obama delivered notable speeches in Berlin, Germany. 
And he gave those speeches in front of the Brandenburg Gate. Not sure why they chose that spot. It's very interesting architecture, considering what we're talking about. You can see the Brandenburg Gate. You see the seat of Satan, throne of Satan, and then Hitler's arena. But, you know, it doesn't stop there with Obama. There's another matter of Obama's stage at the 2008 Democratic Convention when he gave his speech. So put this back in your mind for a moment. And then look at the stage when he gave his speech. And the fact that and I'm not trying to say he's Hitler. I'm, that's not my political opinion. I'm just saying how interesting. I think it's interesting because, as I always say, the, the gods that were there then, the gods that have been with us, small g, since the beginning are still there. They're still operating. And they possess powerful people to do dirty things. So there you got them side by side. So, again, I find it extremely interesting. Just thought I'd bring that to light for what it's worth. But back to what here lies before us in the word. We heard Jesus say, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. And again, we talked a lot about this last time we were together, where Jesus says, I know. I know. And in this case, he says, I know your works. He said the same thing to Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. And I'm not going to go all into that deep like I did last time, but the fact is nothing is overlooked. Jesus sees it all. And then he said to them, you hold fast my, to my name and do not deny my faith. And that word hold or that term hold fast, it means to use strength. It means to seize. So it's something they did intentionally and they did it well because Jesus brings it out here. And then Jesus noted that they, quote, did not deny my faith. Jesus praised the believers of Pergamos because they did not deny his faith. So I'd say it's always important to make sure that the faith we hold on to is the faith that belongs to Jesus. He, dem he demonstrated that faith for us. And we know that all good things come from him. And so even that gift that he gives us of faith began with him. And he says, and you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So this man among the believers of Pergamos received a precious title, my faithful martyr. And the same title was assigned to Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we read, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. And you can say, wait a minute. I thought it was martyr, and now you're saying witness. Well, that is what martyr means, is witness. We, we really fast to use the word witness as Christians. I'm a witness for Christ. I will witness for Christ. We don't use that other word very often, that I'm a martyr for Christ. I'll be a martyr for Christ. That line is pretty bare, but yet that's what it is. Being a witness for Christ is being willing, I would say, for the martyrdom to come. So Antipas was a man who followed Jesus. You would have to say he was like Jesus in the sense of, of his behavior, his actions, his, his faith. Antipas is one of the great, nearly anonymous heroes of the Bible. Because we're told nothing about Antipas except this one historical fact that he was martyred. But what's important is Jesus saw him. And Jesus took notice and included him here. Antipas lived where Satan's throne was. He stood against the attacks and the evil around him. And he fulfilled the meaning of his own name. Because Antipas means against all. Look at verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. 
So Jesus praised the believers of Pergamos for holding fast to his name and keeping his faith. But Jesus did not allow the difficulties of their environment to be an excuse for the things that he had against them. Jesus rebuked the church for allowing men with evil doctrine to continue in fellowship with them. There were those who held the doctrine of Balaam and, then, and of the Nicolaitans, what we've, we've met once before. And as I noted earlier, Baal was associated with the Greek god Zeus. So they had this influence there in Pergamos, like right in their face. And the doctrine of Balaam sanctioned eating things, sacrificed to idols. It endorsed sexual immorality. And Baal, that god, small g, was the embodiment of paganism and all the pagan gods. His name can be translated as lord or owner or master. And then the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which we talked about before, it's not really defined. Um, Many Bible scholars feel that these Nicolaitans were liberals, teaching that those under grace were free to practice idolatry and sexual sin. And we saw the Nicolaitans mentioned with the church of Ephesus, but there with the Ephesus church, we saw that they refused to tolerate them. But it appears the Pergamos church failed to do the same thing. Look at verse 16. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So this call to repent, it's pretty much the clarion clarion call to most of the seven churches that are written about here in Revelations, because five of the seven churches are commanded to repent. And repent is a command that applies to the entire lifetime of all believers. You know, sometimes people play it off and they think repentance was just involved in that process of coming to faith in Jesus. But it's not that. It's an ongoing process of recognizing sin and then turning from it and turning back to God. So by repenting, the church of Pergamum would expel the evil from their midst. But if they failed to repent, Jesus said he would fight against the evil himself. So Jesus is going to have his way over the evil, but he's encouraging the church to take care of the problem because the church is capable of taking care of the problem. But he's always going to bring that judgment into the church because as the scripture says, that's where it begins. In 1 Peter 4, 17, it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So he said to them, repeating now, I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now remember, the sword of God's word is a two-edged sword. So it cuts one way to bless, and it cuts another way to judge. And then the beginning of the next verse, verse 17 Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the dangers the church at Pergamos faced are the same challenges the church faces today, the same challenge we face today. There's always the danger of allowing false teaching and immorality to slither into the church, and worse, to remain there. That's one of the bigger problems. If it comes in and we're aware, we have a chance to get rid of it, and we must. But so often it's mishandled and it stays. And that's where the real danger happens. The leaven that leavens the whole lump. And as I said before, the reason is because the same gods roam the earth today. And they still seek to rob and to kill and destroy. Therefore, it's imperative that we, as the church, take this invitation to hear what the Spirit is saying. As an invitation that is still as current and crucial today as it was two millennia ago. And then look at the rest of that verse. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And here another common thing that we see throughout the Lord's instruction to these churches is the words to him who overcomes. And in this case, it's the one who overcomes this spirit of accommodation of false teaching and evil. And if they do that, it says that they'll receive hidden manna, 
<clears throat> now, some of this is rather mysterious. Hidden manna. But manna is a type of Jesus himself, when you think about it. It's a picture of God. He's a picture of God's perfect daily provision. And by his own words, we know that he's the true bread from heaven. And Jesus said that of himself. In John 6, verse 41, he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And then in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And we saw that in the example of the manna being given to the the Hebrews in the wilderness. Came every day. It was all that they needed. It was their daily provision. And I always like to picture, too, the fact that they weren't to hoard it. They were to use it. Because if they didn't use it, it would spoil. And so I don't think we could ever cause Jesus to spoil. But we could spoil our relationship with him by not making the most of that daily provision of him being in our lives day in and day out. Now, the white stone mentioned here becomes even more mysterious. It's been explained in many ways. Some of those ways is that it was a token of acquittal in a legal case. It was a symbol of victory in an athletic contest. It was an expression of welcome given by a host to a guest. And it seems clear that it is a reward given by the Lord to the overcomer, expressing individual approval by him. And then what's the meaning of this new secret name promised to him who overcomes? Some wonder, is it God's name there? Or is it the name for the believer? I think it's likely the believer's new name, with the name itself being more important than the stone itself. And just my own thinking, I like to think of the new name being reflective of how God knows and relates to us. You know, a symbol of our relationship with him from his perspective. I mean, maybe whatever that name is, is how he refers to us, what he calls us. And then I think how cool that would be to know. I mean, our parents, our earthly parents named us. But does, and I'm sure God knows that name. But what's he call us? I don't know. Speculation on our part, but it's kind of a neat thought. So we'll rest between this and the next church. And again, you know, we could go through three, four of these churches in an evening. But then I think we'd be missing a lot. And like I said at the very beginning of this, I believe the Lord wanted us to take the time to really drill down into each church one at a time. So we'll be, we'll be loyal to that. Well, Father, we thank you again for this evening, for this time and in your word, Lord, and just seeing all these different things. And Lord, just hearing what you expect from your church. Lord, I love that you're direct so we don't have to question what you want and we don't even have to question how we change if change is necessary. You give us that instruction. So, Lord, I pray we'd be honest with ourselves as we continue this study, that we would see those areas where either we're doing well that we might continue or where there's room for work or even repentance. So we give you honor and glory tonight. We ask that you get us home safely and prepare us for tomorrow. Keep us safe in the heat, Lord, over the next few days. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.